In this lecture, Models of the Atom, we're going to explore the different models of the atom and what we know about the auto of the atom now. It says the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything, save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe, and that's from Albert Einstein. Uh, our thinking of the atom has evolved so much in the 20th and 21st century that it has completely changed everything about us. The idea of nuclear power comes from our knowledge of the atom. So the learning goals. You should be able to understand the experimental designs, results, and analysis that led to the various models of the atom. So what that means is we're going to look at every individual experiment. We're going to say, okay, what does this experiment mean and what does it lead us to believe? We're going to understand the history of the periodic table. We're going to understand why it's developed the way that it is. There were a couple of different competing models and we're going to understand why we chose the one that we chose. You're going to understand the characteristics of each periodic family. Now, each periodic family uh, there are several of them, so you need to know the characteristics of each in order to be able to identify where it belongs. And you should understand the atomic radius and how to determine the general size according to the periodic chain. So you should be able to look at the periodic table. The periodic table is going to be your end-all, be-all. You should be able to figure out most of the questions based on your interpretation of the periodic table. All right, the first experiment we're going to talk about is Dalton's experiment. Now, Dalton was the first one to provide any sort of experimental evidence that light are that we had atoms. And how we did that is if you take a look at that this, Dalton mixed gases in various amounts. So specifically he was working with hydrogen and oxygen. And he figured that if he took hydrogen and oxygen in two to one, he would get something. He figured that if he mixed hydrogen and oxygen in two to one, he would get something else. So for example, if this was hydrogen and oxygen, this could be something like H2O. If you have two hydrogens and two oxygens, it could be something like H2O2. And if you had something like this, you would have HO2. So Dalton figured out that if he could mix the gases in these certain amounts, that maybe he could combine them to make new products. Well, these are the results of his experiments. What he did is he actually mixed together these things in various amounts. Now, he didn't have balloons back then. It was actually much more difficult for him to do this. But he mixed two parts of, hy of hydrogen and one part of oxygen and got one part of water because we now know that water is H2O. So when he mixed three parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen, he expected to get H3O, but instead what he got was H2O plus one leftover hydrogen gas. And he looked at all these various things, and every time when it came up to it, he ended up getting a two to one ratio. And this is actually the first discovery that water was H2O. He got this two to one ratio indicating that um, water was H2O. And every time he had a leftover of hydrogen and oxygen, it actually showed up here. It didn't show up um, as another part of something else. It didn't change the water into something else. So Dalton was the first one to come up with this, uh, this idea that you have these um, atoms rearranging and making new things. This is Dalton right here. Uh, Dalton, he postulated a few things on the basis of this experiment. He said that elements are small particles called atoms. Okay, so this is the first statement saying, okay, there are elements of different things, and at the smallest level, they're called atoms. He said all atoms of an element are identical. Okay, so if you have two copper atoms, those two copper atoms are going to be the exact same. He also said that atoms can't be divided, created, or destroyed. You can't cut an atom in half. In fact, the word atoms comes from atomos, which means indivisible. He also said you can't create an atom or you can't destroy an atom. You can basically just rearrange them into different molecules. He says that atoms combine in whole number ratios. So you can have like H2O, but you can't have H half O three quarters. It doesn't make any sense to do that because atoms can't be divided. And finally, he said that atoms can be combined, separated, or rearranged. So you can take these hydrogen and oxygen atom, atoms and you can rearrange them into H2O. You can even rearrange them into H2O2. You can rearrange them into lots of different things. Well, based on this analysis, Dalton came up with his idea of what he thought an atom was. And basically, he thought an atom was like a marble. It was a solid, indivisible, homogeneous particle, which means it's a composed of elements. It is indivisible. You cannot crack this sphere open. It's spherical. Okay, and it is homogeneous. Now this marble right here is not homogeneous. There's an orange thing in the middle somewhere. But according to Dalton's model, uh, everything was the exact same. So it is a solid, uniform sphere. Okay, the next experiment is the J.J. Thompson experiment. And the J.J. Thompson experiment was one in which he was actually trying to crack open the atom. 
there have been some indications that maybe the atom was not quite as uh, indivisible as we had previously thought. And so what Thompson did is he said, okay, I'm going to take this thing called a cathode ray, and I'm going to, which is made by whenever I take a gas and fill it, uh, a tube with it, and then create a large voltage in it. And I'm going to take these cathode rays, and I'm going to aim these cathode rays in between two charged plates. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because I know the cathode ray has to come from the gas, because there's nothing in the tube but gas. So if I fill the gas, and then I put electricity into it, the cathode ray has to come from the gas. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to see what happens if it moves towards one of the charged plates. If it moves towards one of the charged plates, then I can know a little bit something about this cathode ray that was produced by the gas. So what he did is he actually fired this thing through. Uh, whenever he fired it through and the top plate was positive and the bottom plate was negative, it moved upward. Whenever the top plate was positive and the bottom plate was positive, there was no change. It went straight through. And then now, whenever it was negative on the top plate and positive on the bottom plate, it went downward. So if you look, it seems to be moving away from the negative charge and towards the positive charge. So we can definitely see a pattern that whenever it's positive, it moves upward. Whenever it's uh, positive, it moves downward because it's moving towards the bottom plate or the top plate. And it seems to be moving away from the negative. So that's kind of the pattern that you can see in the data. So now what do we know? Well, we know that Thomson knew Coulomb's law, which says that opposites attract. If opposites attract, that means that the cathode ray has to be some sort of negative charge. So what he did is he said, okay, well, this is clearly indicating to me that atoms can be divided into smaller constituents. And the reason why he said that is he took a neutral gas and he was able to make an, a negative charge. So atoms are neutral, but they're a negative charge. Now we all know those negative charges are called electrons. Okay, but he didn't know this at the time. He just knew, hey, there's a neutral atom and there's a negative piece. Well, if the atom is overall has no charge, and then you have a piece with a negative charge, that means that there's gotta be a positive charge somewhere also. So Thompson, he broke this model up. He broke Dalton's model, indivisible atom, up into two distinct pieces, a positive one and a negative one. He came up with this. This is called Thompson's model of the atom. A lot of times it's referred to as the plum pudding model or the chocolate chip cookie model. But basically what it is, is everything is positive. This whole blue part is all positive. Okay, the blue part. The whole blue part is positive, and the only part that's negative are these little red dots. Those are the negative parts. And those negative particles, he called corpsicles of charge, but they're actually just electrons. So basically you have a sea of positive matter, and in, buried within it there are negative electrons. All right, next up we have the Geiger-Marsden experiment. A lot of times it's referred to as the Rutherford experiment because it was done in Rutherford's lab. But these were two students of Rutherford's who actually did the experiment. And they came on, they went on to be famous on, on their own, so they get a little bit of credit for their experiment. So what we have here is we have alpha particles. Alpha particles are a helium nucleus. So we think of helium as generally being, you know, helium and then there's two electrons. What we do is we strip away those electrons and now this helium is an alpha particle. So what they do is they fire these alpha particles in here towards this gold foil. Well, when they fired it in at the gold foil, um, they got some interesting results. Now the reason why they chose gold is gold is extremely malleable to the point where you can get just a few atoms thick of gold, like six to 10 atoms thick. You can actually have gold foil that's so thin that you can see through it. And so that's why they chose gold. They were trying to look at individual atoms. Now, if you were to use something different like uh, iron, it'd be so much thicker that you wouldn't be able to actually um, see any of the results. You'd have too many atoms in the way. So what they did is they took these alpha particles and they fired them with the gold foil. Now, they surrounded this entire thing with a detector. So whenever they, off, this thing right here is capable of detecting alpha particles. Whenever an alpha particle hits this detector, it actually leaves a little dot. And so you can see the dots where they are based on the experiment. So what they did is they did this and they fired about 8,000 um, alpha particles per trial, roughly. And what they found is that you get this. Out of 8,000 trials, you get roughly 7,200 that get straight through. So when you fire it right here, 
about 7,200 get straight through. There's no deflection. They go straight through, which is what you would expect. If you're firing an alpha particle at, at this little thin sheet of gold foil, um, the way that uh, it was described is they actually describe it as taking a piece of Kle uh, Kleenex and shooting a tank turret. So you would expect the tank turret to just go right through. So most of them went through. Now they actually found that some, about 799 of them, were slightly deflected. So by slightly deflected, they would go right here. Or right here. So slightly deflected. It ran into something, but it still went through. And that kind of made sense too. But what really didn't make any sense is out of every 8,000 trials, you'd have one that would kick back. And now it's just one. But they would repeat this, and we'd have the same kind of ratio every time. About every 8,000, you'd have one that would kick back. One that would kick back. And so the pattern is, is this is just one deflection. It's, it's there. And what does it mean? And so that's when we get to the analysis. The analysis says, okay, since we were firing positive helium charge, we are firing positive helium particles, because remember we took the electrons away, that they must be running into another positive charge. When they run into that other positive charge, remember opposites attract, so that means these two like charges are actually going to push away from each other. So that's going to push this helium back in the same direction that it came from. So what they did is they said there's got to be a small positive charge that they now call the nucleus. Now the reason why it had to be small is because it only happened one out of 8,000 times. Okay, If it happened half the time, it would be a bigger particle. But because it only happened very few times, it has to be a very, very small, densely charged particle. Now, it turns out that the majority of the mass of an atom is in the nucleus. So the proton has much, much more mass than anything else. Now, the reason why most of the um, alpha particles went through is because the majority of an atom is made up of mostly empty space. So if you look right here, here are most of our, our trials. They're going straight through the empty space of the atom. Now, only occasionally when you have a dead-on shot on the nucleus does it actually come back. And then occasionally you have one that's not quite dead-on, but it's close enough to make it deflect. So this explains right, right now we have the atom that is made of mostly empty space, and we have a positive charge in the middle. And that led to Rutherford's view of the atom. Now, Rutherford's view of the atom says this. It's basically called the planetary model. It says you have a positive nucleus at the center, okay, and then you have electrons that move around the nucleus, uh, at different energies depending on the distance. So all these electrons travel in a circle around. Okay, now they travel in a circle around in different orbits. So just like the planets travel around uh, the sun. Now, Rutherford knew there were problems with this. He knew that there were issues that eventually every electron would collapse into the proton because opposites attract. So even though he knew that this wasn't right, this was his best guess. Remember, science is a series of best guesses as you go through and looking for experiments to disprove your I come to the Bohr experiment. The Bohr experiment is you take tubes and you fill them with gas again and you supply them with a very large voltage. It's a very similar setup to Thompson's experiment. But instead of that, what we did is um, you can actually, if you put enough voltage in there, you can actually see it light up. That's what a neon light is. If you've ever seen a neon light, it's a very small gas or glass tube filled with gas and then when you flip on the electricity, it runs a high voltage through it and that lot high voltage causes the gas to glow. So that's basically what Bohr's experiment did, is he made a little neon light. But he filled it with different gases. And what he did is when he filled it with different gases and he put it through different high voltages, he got some interesting results, and those results are here. So if you look, this is what's called an emission spectrum. So whenever you fill a glass with helium and then you put voltage into it, it produces a certain color of light. And whenever you look at that light through something called a spectroscope, that spectroscope will tell you the exact wavelengths of those colors of light. So if you look, helium has very specific colors. There's kind of a bluish line there, a green line there, a yellow line there, an orange and a red. Now if you look at hydrogen, which is very similar to helium, they're both very small, they both have very uh, limited number of electrons and all those sorts of things, they're very similar. You get well, there's these couple of lines right here. Yeah, there's actually a couple of lines right here, very thick lines right there, indicating uh, a very wide transition level there. And then you also have these right here. 
So if you know, as similar as helium and hydrogen are, their spectroscopes are very, very different. Okay, so it turns out that what patterns do you see? Well, mercury, mercury is not similar to hydrogen or helium at all. Neon, which is a noble gas, is also a noble gas as helium. So if you were to take a look at these, you would expect some sort of similarities between the two. But if you look at helium, helium is just fairly simple, but basically one line in each color, whereas neon is very complex. You have very uh, large number of greens, a couple of yellows, and lots of orange to reddish ones. So it's really hard to kind of see any sort of pattern. Now, sodium is interesting because it has two lines that are yellow, and that's it. So as far as patterns in the data, there really are none. And in fact, that's the results that we were looking for. It turns out that every atom produces a consistent and unique spectral pattern, the key there being unique. So most elements produce few colors. In fact, there are very few spectral lines for a lot of them. And they're all unique. So what this indicates is that electrons must have discrete energies. Okay, we're going to talk about this a little bit later in this unit, but basically, how you create light is an electron is here and it falls down. Whenever it falls down, it produces light. Well, depending on the, the energy difference between these two lines depends on what color you get. And we'll go into that in more detail, but basically what this means is the electrons all have to have a certain energy. So discrete means a certain energy. Okay, so you, it can be one or two, but it can't be uh, 1.5. Now that's an oversimplification, but it says it has to have this or this, but it can't be in between. So now, Bohr developed his model of the atom. And what he developed is he said, okay, electrons orbit the nucleus. Okay, kind of similar to what Rutherford said. But the, here's the difference. It says electrons must travel at a specific distance. So this right here, all the electrons are on this line. You don't see anything in between or they're on this line, and you don't see anything in between. It says these distances are called orbitals. So that's what we're talking about right here with orbitals. It's where the electrons are actually at. Okay, we say absorbing energy causes an electron to move higher. So if all of a sudden, for some reason, this atom absorbs a lot of energy, what happens is one of these electrons will kick up to the higher level and be right here now. Whenever it wants to lose energy, because atoms generally don't like to have high energy. This energy, this electron will fall back down, and whenever it falls back down, it will emit light in whatever color that it was. So that's the Bohr model of the atom. Now, this is the atom that we're going to be most concerned with in this class. We will talk a little bit about some further theories, but this is the one that's the primary theory for this class. It, it, it is sufficient to answer most of the questions that we will. All right, so this is uh, example A1 for looking at models of the atom. This is explain how our model of the atom would differ if the results of the Geiger-Marsden experiment would have resulted in the following. So this is a hypothetical data set. This is not real. And this is an example of a high-level question that you could see on your test because it's asking you to look at some data and apply one of the models to it and see if there's a difference. So what we see here is we see that there are 8,000 shots and 8,000 particles with no deflection. In other words, so we have our gold foil, we have our circular detector, when we fire the alpha particles in, they all go straight through. But when they all go straight through, that's indicating that there's no collision with the nucleus. So really, there's two possible outcomes. Okay, the first possible outcome is that the nucleus is incredibly small. I'm talking about extremely small where we would never be able to detect it. Okay, right now, the nucleus, it varies depending on the size, but is on the scale of 10 to the minus 14th or 15th. So it's really, 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 really small. But in order to have no collisions, the odds of that are so small that really that's not even a great answer right here. So you could say that the nucleus is much smaller, yes, but that's not even the best answer. The best answer would be, well, then Thompson was right. And the reason for that is... Thompson said there was no nucleus. He said that here's the atom and you had your electrons, but most of this was positive charge. And if you're firing 
if you're firing uh, alpha particles at these, yeah, it's a positive charge, but that positive charge is kind of spread around. So it would still allow this alpha particle to get through. So because of the fact that there's no deflections, that would indicate that Thompson's model of the atom was right, that there is no nucleus, or at the very most that the nucleus is very, very, very small. So this is an example of the type of thinking that you're going to have to do on your test. You're going to have to be able to not only know the experiments, know the data, but say, okay, what if it was different? Okay, so now this one says, assume that electrons could have an energy, uh, could have any energy in an atom. Describe what the results of the Bohr line spectra experiment would be using the clear method. So now remember, the clear method, you want your conclusion, you want your evidence, and you want your reasoning. Okay, so your very first line should be the answer. Then your next line should be, okay, based on something from this paragraph. So based on something like the line spectrum. And then the last one is your reasoning, is your justification. Why does this evidence lead you to this answer? Now remember, when we talked about the Bohr model, we said that the Bohr model emitted certain colors because the electron could only go from here to here. Now this is saying, how would it be different, assuming that electrons could be anywhere in between? So I'm going to go ahead and let you take a look at this one. I want you to find your own evidence and reasoning, but really the answer is that um, every emission spectroscope would give all colors of light. So you wouldn't be able to distinguish them. Now I want you to go ahead and take a look and I want you to find your own evidence and reasoning. This one says, which of the following is the most accurate model for the atom? Justify your answer using the clear method. So uh, remember the clear method is conclusion, evidence, and then reasoning. So now what you want to do is to say the answer is obviously the Bohr model. But now you provide the evidence and the reasoning for why. Because that's the majority of the answer. So if this is a test question, the fact that you got the Bohr might be between one-third and half of the points. But the majority of it, or the majority of it, or at least half of it, is going to become from the evidence and, and reason. You've got to not only know the answer, you've got to know why it's the answer. All those experiments and everything give us the information that follows. We know that a proton is a positive charged particle. We know that it's found in the nucleus. We know that it has a large mass. Now, this is a large mass, relatively speaking. So I know it's not the same mass as, let's say, a person or a building, but it is a very, very large mass. In fact, it's one of the most dense materials in the entire universe. We know that this large mass occupies a very, very small volume. And we know that it that the protons, the number of protons, determines what element it is. Okay, if if two atoms have identical number of protons, it doesn't matter if they have the same number of neutrons, electrons, they are the same element. Okay, so protons are really important in identifying what the element actually is. We also know, based on our experiments that we've discussed, that the electron, that is E minus, is the negative charge particle. It actually has the exact same amount of negative charge as a proton. So where a proton is plus one, an electron is minus one, those are, they cancel each other out to make it neutral. Even though the proton is much, much, much more massive than an electron, they still have the same charge value. Now, the electrons are found in orbits around the nucleus, so they're at specific locations. An electron has an extremely small mass. Okay? It is much, much, much smaller to, than a proton, to the point where it's called negligible. You don't even count for electrons when you talk about the mass of an atom. It's just that small. We know that the electrons move in a large volume. So whereas the protons, neutrons, and electrons are confined to the nucleus, the electrons are traveling out here. Now, it's, it's really kind of... Uh, it's not a great drawing right here, because really, if the protons were right here, then the electrons would be so far off the screen that you wouldn't even be able to see them. Okay? The electrons travel at a huge distance from the proton, at least relatively speaking. Now, the electron will determine, the number of electrons will determine if the atom is an ion. Now, an ion is, we'll talk about a little bit later, but an ion is when there's a different number of protons than electrons. So overall, the atom could have a charge, like Ca2+. That right there says that there are two more protons than there are electrons. So the number of electrons determines that, whereas the number of protons determines the element. 
All right, so we get to the Chadwick experiment. This is just another experiment, and this was trying to determine, trying to find the last of our subatomic particles that we're going to discuss in this class. And basically what they knew is that polonium gave off a type of radiation called alpha particles. Same alpha particles we talked about before. He said that these alpha particles can collide with beryllium, okay, which is element number four on our periodic table. And whenever it co uh, collides with this beryllium, it appears uh, the particles seem to come off beryllium. Okay? And so when these particles came off beryllium, they were trying to they had it collide then with something called paraffin. So here's the entire setup and the results. What happened was the beryllium lost mass. Okay, so it lost mass even though it didn't lose any sort of charge. The, the protons were still there. It was still beryllium, but it lost mass. Now, that seemed to indicate that it wasn't electrons that were moving around because electrons don't really have any mass. It wasn't protons because it was still beryllium. So that led to the belief that it was a third particle. When these particles, these these unknown particles that are now known as neutrons hit something called paraffin, which is kind of like a wax. This paraffin then, all of a sudden, protons came out the other side. Now, these protons, they knew they were protons because they had something called an ionization chamber, which basically had a, uh, you know, positive charges and negative charges, and they could see which way they reflected. So, basically, they knew that these charges were attracted to a negative plate. So they knew they were protons. So now, what does that lead us to believe? Well, this is Chadwick right here. He won a Nobel Prize in the 1930s, I think. He says he, they knew that there is an electrically neutral particle in the atom. That's called the neutron. They know that this particle has a mass similar to a proton, okay? because they initially thought it might be a proton and they saw it until they saw it was still brilliant. So they knew that it has a mass very similar. They know that the particle can be converted into a proton. And they know that the particle resides in the nucleus. So what Chadwick did is he basically just added his stuff to the model of the atom. So basically, this is the same picture as it was before for the Bohr model, but now we're adding in neutrons. So you have protons that are the green, you have neutrons that are the blue. And so protons and neutrons are held together in the nucleus, and that the electrons are um, surround the nucleus in distinct orbits. So really all he did was add the missing mass characteristic. Now, the neutron was very difficult to find because it's a neutral particle. It's really, really hard to detect that neutral particle. So we come to the organization of elements. So we know uh, that we have different elements now that are composed of different numbers of protons. And we needed to figure out a way to kind of organize these. This, this guy named Dmitry Mendeleev, he was the first one to kind of take a crack at organizing these in, in some sort of manner that you could use. And what he did is he actually took all these elements and he organized them by mass. So he took the different elements with the different masses, and he kind of set them up. And you can see his periodic table, which is right here, and how he's got the masses there, and they line up. Now, an interesting thing that he actually noticed is that there were gaps where there should be elements. If you look at the patterns, there are gaps that there should be an element in that there's not. And he actually, one of his brilliant insights is that he actually, left, he actually left those gaps there. He didn't try and fill them in. It turns out what he was doing is he was predicting the discovery of, the, of future elements. And this is actually a very good organizational chart. Um, it turns out that whenever you line these things up, they had very similar properties. Okay, whenever you line these up, they had very similar properties. Now, it wasn't great, it wasn't perfect, but they did have very similar properties. But he, and this leaving gaps allows for prediction of, of future elements. And in fact, elements were predicted based on Mendeleev's periodic table. Now, we don't actually use periodic tables, and there's a reason why. Uh, we're going to explore that reason a little bit later. Today's periodic table is organized by atomic number, which is the number of protons. So basically what we do is we say, okay, the number of protons determines where it is on the periodic table. It is more consistent than organizing by mass. So whenever Mendeleev's periodic table, it pretty much lined up with chemical properties. The atomic number always lines up. So it, you always get the same pattern of chemical properties whenever you line them up in these, in these columns. These vertical columns have similar chemical properties. Now, you should bookmark this site today, this ptable.com. It will be your best friend in terms of answering questions in this class. Uh, it gives you the periodic table that you see here. It also does it based on electromagnetic.
conductivity, which is something we'll cover, ionization, isotopes, everything that you will possibly use a periodic table for is there at that website. It also provides links for you to be able to study from. You need to bookmark that site ASAP. So, we will move on to chemical periods. Chemical periods are elements that are in the same row of the periodic table. So if you look, those same ones that come across, that indicates a chemical period. All the chemical periods, all the elements in a chemical period have similar energy orbitals. So in other words, when I look right here at the first chemical period, what it does is it has a protons and it has one electron orbital. That's the one orbital that's the one right there. When I come right down here to the second one, let me change colors real quick. When I come right down here to the second one, this one has the original first orbital and it adds a second orbital. When I go to the third one, I go to the third row, it adds a third electron orbital uh, level. So these chemical periods relate to the number of electron um, orbits that you have. Chemical families. Now, chemical families are elements that are in the same column. So if you look right here, we see elements that are coming down. So you have elements right here that come down, and these are indicative of chemical families. So all the elements in the column are of the same family, and all elements share similar chemical properties. So lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium all are very, very similar. In fact, hydrogen's a little bit like them, but hydrogen's kind of an exception. That's why it's a different color. Hydrogen is considered to be kind of its own thing. Okay, if you look right here, these are called the noble gases. They all have very similar reactivity. They're all gases, for the most part, except when you get to iodine. But they're all gases that don't react with other things. They don't like to mix with other things. These right here, they are all the same in the fact that they're very reactive. So all these chemical families have similar chemical properties. Now we're going to go through each of those chemical properties. Now. So the first one is alkali metals. Alkali metals are in group one. Remember, groups are ones that go vertically. They are all soft and metallic. Okay, so you can cut them with a butter knife. Okay, they're metallic, so they look like they're metal. They're lustrous, which means they're bright, they're shiny, and they are the most reactive metal. If you were to take something like sodium and throw it in water, it would explode not just react, but explode, because the, because the reaction would be that quick and that violent. By the time you get to cesium in water, you're talking about huge explosions. So, alkali metals, soft, shiny metals that react with just about anything. Alkaline earth metals, okay? So first we had alkali, now we have alkaline earth metals. Now these right here are group two. They're very similar to group one, they're soft, and they're metallic, but they tend to be dull. They tend to not be as, as shiny as the group one. And that can be kind of a tough thing to distinguish between. But the easiest one is they are reactive, but they are not nearly as reactive as group one. Okay, you can have a piece of calcium or, or magnesium, um, and it's not going to explode in the water. It will react with the water. It will dissolve in the water. It will react, but it will not explode like you would see in group one. Next, we have the transition metals. The transition metals include all of these right here. Three okay, through, we do three through 12. Or three through, yes, we should say three through 12. Okay? Now, what that means is these are, these are transition metals. They're kind of the in-between. And these are actually ones that we use a lot in terms of electricity and, and heat. They are hard and they are metallic. Okay, they're not soft. You can't cut them with a knife anymore. They're metallic, they're lustrous, they're shiny. They turned, when you put them in solution, when you put iron or something in a solution, it will actually turn the solution a color. So if you put iron in water, it generally turns it red. Okay, and they are good conductors of both heat and electricity. So those are the transition metals. Halogens, which are in group 17, they are generally gases at room temperature, kind of until you get to iodine. Iodine tends to be a liquid. Um, they are highly reactive with non-metals. Okay, if you were to put a sodium and a chloride together, they would react very quickly and sort of exchange electrons that we talk about. Halogens are extremely lethal to, to organisms, to all biological organisms. If you were to take chlorine or fluorine gas okay, and expose any sort of 
creature that's alive to it, it would be lethal to that particular uh, organism. Noble gases, they're the last column. It's group 18, they are gases at room temperature, and they are non-reactive. By non-reactive, I mean they don't, you can take uh, helium and you can mix it with sodium, which is highly reactive and nothing will happen. Okay, you can take argon and mix it with chlorine. The chlorine is highly reactive, but it won't do anything because argon doesn't react. Okay, so you see an example there of, of uh, neon gases and argon. You tend to see things like this, uh, or neon lights, which is, by the way, the same setup as the Bohr model uh, experiment. So the last thing we're going to talk about for this particular lecture is atomic radon. So if you were to look at the periodic trends, as you move down the periodic table, the atomic radii will increase. And that makes sense because if you take this proton and you have one orbit and you move down the periodic table, you're adding another orbit, another orbit, another orbit. Every time you add an orbit, you're actually going to increase the size of the, of the atom. So that makes sense. Now what probably may be a little different for some of you is that as you move across, you're actually going to shrink the size of the atom. And people say, well, wait a second, I'm adding more electrons. Why is that shrinking the atom? Well, if you have Let's say I have one electron. So these are all, this is full right here, and I have one electron. Well, this one electron is going to be pulled towards the nucleus. But whenever I put a second one there, there's going to be even more pull towards the nucleus. So you're increasing the charge, so you're going to increase the, the pull between the two. And when you add another electron, you're going to increase the pull even greater. When you add another one, you're going to increase the pull even greater. So you're actually going to move this electron orbit slightly in each time you add an electron to it. So you're actually making the atom slightly smaller with every electron you add. Now that's true until you fill up this orbital. Once you fill up this orbital, you're going to add another layer and so you're going to go down the periodic table and you'd increase the size of the atom. So if you look going across, you increase, 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 increase. Now when you go back to the other side, now you decrease it. So magnesium and copper have similar atomic radiuses because of their positions on the periodic table. If we were to look at it, magnesium is in the second, excuse me, the third row, so it has three orbitals. So it has one, two, three orbitals. And then that third orbital has two electrons. So those two electrons don't really make this orbital move in very much. In fact, it's pretty much at its furthest distance. If you had one electron, it would be a little further. But really, this orbital is the most that it could be. Now, copper, on the other hand, copper has four orbitals. So one, two, three, four. Now, copper has a greater amount of protons in the nucleus than magnesium. So the pull is going to be greater just because of the sheer number of positive charges. Okay, so the pull is going to be greater. So even if I have an electron that's at a further distance, the fact that I have more of an attractive force is going to pull it closer uh, than it would if it was just this number, or magnesium is number 12 of protons. So now, yes, it's at the fourth level. That's true. But it's at the fourth level with um, 11 electrons. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 electrons. Now remember, the more electrons you add to these outer layers, the more the orbital collapses. So although copper is in the fourth period, and magnesium is in the third period, they have roughly similar atomic radii. Now I didn't draw it quite that way, but they have roughly similar atomic radii because of that. Okay, this is example B2. It says in the fifth period, all outer electrons uh, orbit the same energy level, although they have different atomic radii and re reactivity. What is the relationship between atomic radii and reactivity? Okay, I will tell you that there is no f relationship between the two. So there's no relationship between atomic radii and reactivity. Now what I want you to do is I want you to go back through and I want you to justify it based on the discussion that we've had about families and atomic radon. So go through and take a look at the, the chemical properties of, of families and the atomic radii as you look at the trends on the periodic table and use it to justify the answer that there is no relationship between these two. 
So this one says, in example B3, what element in the halogens has the greatest atomic radius? Um, well, there's two, there's two choices, right? And, and the first one is we go all the way to the halogens, which is group 17, and we'll figure out the one that has the largest atomic radius. You have to move down the periodic table. Well, when you move down the periodic table, um, there's basically two elements. There's element 85, which is uh, estatine, which is 18, which is the last identified named element. Okay, So that would be a correct answer. But if you look below it, at 117, there's one called un un septium. Now, un un septium, the reason why it hasn't been given an official name yet is because they're still going through the data to determine whether or not this, this element has actually been discovered. But it has been preliminarily discovered, so we call it un un septium. So either one of these answers is, is correct. It's the one that's the furthest down. Uh, in group this is example B4. It says, uh, what example or what elements would have the same chemical properties as calcium? So when you look for the same chemical properties, remember you're looking for the ones that are in the same um, group, in the same chemical family, so the same column. So go ahead and look and see if you can figure out what those are. I will tell you that one of them is going to be BE. So go ahead and figure out what the rest are.